Folks, what's up? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Am I there? I'm gonna do it on my phone this week. Looks pretty good to me. Uh, I've got the coffee made. It's instant. But hey, we're traveling. We do what we gotta do. And it's late. It's, uh, well, it's not late. You know, it's kind of late for coffee, but I'm gonna have one anyway. It's working, says Murray. Uh, there he is, says Joshua. Yeah, I was a few minutes late. Sorry about that. We already got 55 people online. That's awesome. Good to see you guys. And, uh, we got, uh, Yakima Washington in the house. And we got, uh, where are all you guys? I'm in, uh, Har Harlgate? I think that's where I am. Hey, from Newfoundland. Uh, so the gym. It's, uh, it's that big storm's hit over here so it's like really really windy and kind of rainy outside but i didn't do today was my first day off actually in uh four or five days we did eight shows in nine days so four and then a day off and then another four and so like today where it was really crappy outside and i just decided to not do anything anyway i was just like i don't want to go out and i lay around <coughs> there's a a nice this is this is kind of like a you know sort of like the average hotel that I'm in, but there was like a really nice hotel spa next door that had a nice restaurant. So I went over there and I sat on a couch and ordered lunch, late lunch or early dinner kind of thing, and just sat there and and went, you know what? I'm not moving. And then I just kept ordering more food. And then I ordered ice cream. And I ordered coffee. And I just sat there for an hour, five minutes, and ate. And then I came back here, and that's all I've done today, and it feels good. Anyways, uh, we were in, uh, yeah, it was, somebody says it was a uh, 64 mile per hour wind in the south. Yeah, pretty high winds. It's like, really kind of weird weather. It's like windy, blustery, like rain blowing in all directions. And it's like, well, it's island weather, isn't it? Wacky island weather. Um, you introduced me to Mike Landau's playing, and I got to meet him and Steve Gadd on Wednesday. That's cool. That's uh, Levi. How was it? Did you, obviously, probably the gig, eh? probably awesome. Um, uh, I was in Liverpool yesterday. I had a great show yesterday. Probably, probably be the biggest shows of the tours, the Liverpool shows. I think the theater's 1,800 or 2,000 or something like that capacity. And it was sold out and it was jammed and awesome. It was really fun. So great way to wrap up eight gigs in nine days for sure. Uh, Keith says he's playing his PT-15 and he loves it. That's awesome, man. Tell me about how you're using it and stuff what you're finding they sure are fun i love mine do i have a preference over four eight or 16 ohms for cabs i tend to use eight ohm cabs i mean if it's a marshall i'll use 16 i i don't really have like a like what like like together like if there's a difference in tone if you run a marshall it, there's somebody said that there's more bass i saw if you run a 16 ohms than four ohms like the same like a marshall or something I don't know if that's true. I, I, uh, I do know that driving longer cable lengths. So, like when I'm in the studio, if you drive drive long speaker cable lengths, if you got a cab in another room, it's better to go eight ohms than sixteen because it like starts to get, for whatever reason, like the as the ohms increase, the, the driving longer cables isn't quite as efficient or something. So, uh, that's one factor. So I'll tend to run eight most of the time in the studio. Uh, let's see. Do you know which frequency I should boost if I want my amp to have a little bit more cut presence on my clean sound? Um, well, it's a lot of factors, but, like, I find that uh, if I want a sound to cut through somewhere like the high mids, um, which I consider to be... 1.5 to 2.5 kilohertz, something like that. Like, like I'll boost 2K a lot on solos if I want that. If I want a guitar part to cut, um, without sounding like I'm adding a bunch of crispy top end, it just adds this upper mids and kind of gives it a clarity. And like, really, like I'm talking, you can add usually like 2 dB or at the most, and you'll find um, that really tends to clarify. Uh, a guitar sound. So it was like a recluse day. Since then. Yeah, I had a total recluse day. I need it because I'm around people a lot, and I and I love them. They're awesome people and stuff. It's a lot of fun. But you know how it is when you're 
just like living on a bus, like, and you constantly around people, like, um, it's good to have time where you don't even talk to anybody, <laughs> you know, and just, uh, just have a recluse day. Like you say, exactly. You can hear it in my voice too. I'm sick. Um, I've had a, I've got a sinus infection. Like a little, I think it's getting better though. <clears throat> like I think it's slowly getting better. Um, but it's been tough because like the, I've had it pretty much the whole last run of eight shows or whatever. And just, it saps your energy, you know, just like that. I can't believe like, a, how am I going to get up and do a show? And then you get up and totally rock and it's totally cool. But, um, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Mr. Mold says he's going to see us tomorrow in Harrogate. Well, hopefully I'll be better by then. I, I'm hoping I'll get a good sleep tonight and then I'll wake up tomorrow and go, Hey, it's gone. So, Think good thoughts for me. Browsing the Long McQuaid sale flyer for used deals, says Jay. He says he's listening to my record, I guess, drinking. Oh, I guess you're not listening. You're listening to me talk, I see. <laughs> drinking fresh brewed coffee. Good stuff. Awesome. A decompression day, says Mute That Bozo. Uh, good day from Tampa here. Uh, you should listen to I Put a Spell on You Live from John Fogarty. It sounds like Cornell. We used to do that song with Don Henley. Um, first tour I did with him, I played Spell on You. It's a great... I mean, and I've, I actually talked with Cornell about um, Fogarty and said what a great rock vocalist he, he, he was, and he agreed that he was one of the greatest, you know. He had a, an affinity for, for him as well. Uh, Mark... I remember that. Mac G, uh, Denmark. He's from Denmark. Those are some great videos of the classic rock show popping up on YouTube. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah, we have a good time. A good old time. I took a video yesterday, actually, that I'll put up in my next um, vlog uh, where I, I had the phone just sitting on my amp. So it's a little shaky because I guess the cab is probably vibrating the phone a little bit. Um but I put it up for the encore and I caught some little bit of cool footage of playing Won't Get Fooled Again and stuff like that. And so you'll see a bit of that. Uh, yeah, I am having great fun. I am having a really good time. On a $3,000 plus modern or new guitar, our neck pocket cracks. Uh, scra scratched black bridges, headstock scratches, and other obviously rush things acceptable. Um, never with a sir, I assume. I don't think John would let a guitar go out the door like that, that's for sure. And he would be, he's such a stickler about stuff like that, man. Um, some companies maybe, and you know, things can happen, right? Like, um, neck pocket cracks. I mean, it's tough because everybody wants lacquer. And if it's a lacquer guitar and it's shipped across the country or something, you can pull it out of the case and it'll have a neck pocket crack because that's what happens, you know. It's just, it shrinks and it expands. It's part of lacquer. So, but if it's on a poly finish, it would be weird that if they let it go. Um, so I would say it depends, actually. But lacquer, that's what it's going to do. So, um, you know, they don't, Sir doesn't want to do, I mean, I don't want to speak for them, but they don't even like or want to do lacquer on guitars unless it's aged because of the fact that that stuff happens and then people complain. They're like, it's going to happen, so we'll just do antiques if they're, if they're lacquer, you know? Because um, you always get that one guy, it's going to crack, you know? And it's like, yeah, it's lacquer, that's why we shoot poly, but I want lacquer. <laughs> so um, between a rock and a hard place as a builder. Scratches on bridges and stuff. Um, you know, if it's a nice guitar, I don't care, because I kind of beat them up in, in their tools to me. So little things like that don't bother me, but I understand not everybody's like me. Some people want their guitar to be pristine. And I, I get that. How are the fingers holding up? Really good, actually. That's Jim. Um, you guys were rocking at St. Albans. Yeah, really good. My, my hands are in good shape right now. Like, when I pick up the guitar, it doesn't take me very long to warm up anymore. And they're pretty fast. And um, they're good, you know. And so, like, this is, the tour has definitely kicked my butt as far as that goes. You know, I'm sick and all that. But my playing's good. <laughs> my... my um, I feel like I'm like I'm in good, like fighting shape, you know, right now, which is kind of what I wanted. It's the main thing I really wanted to achieve. Uh, all well with the storm? Yeah, just kind of windy, 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 you know, blowing over here uh, for the night in the Netherlands, says Yord. Yeah, it's all good here. I know there was some flooding and stuff in some places. 
Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Looking forward to Salford on Friday. Cool, man. That's Andrew. Come on out. See the show. So we got 256 people online. That's awesome. Thanks for being here, you guys, and hanging in there with me, even when I'm uh, doing it at random times. Sometimes I know today was a Sunday off, so it was real easy to show up essentially on time. Yes, the Gad show was awesome, says Levi. Uh, also saw his board and rig and have questions. I don't know that much about Mike's board. I mean, I know that I think he does the kind of wet-dry thing, runs the effects right into the front of another amp, takes a line out and runs effects into the front of a second amp and stuff, but I don't know what he's got on there right now. Um, it is a unique way to run a rig. It's the same thing Scott Henderson does. Somebody's up there in the top chat. Thanks, man. Love the rig rundown from the Classic Rock show, says Dennis. Thank you for doing the top chat as well. Really appreciate that. Uh, notice the P90s on your T-type. You know who the manufacturer is. I don't, actually. How do you minimize the noise? And I don't. They're noisy as hell. And they actually were pretty noisy yesterday. Because <laughs> there's no uh, shielding on that guitar. It's a very vintage kind of guitar. Um, so I just find the magic spot. Yesterday, I turned up the volume before the song, the first song I played on, which is Who Are You? Um, I turned up the volume, and it was like... Rrr coming through the amp and I was like oh shit because it was like I hadn't actually tried it at sound check yet but that building was really really noisy yesterday so I go I, I'm just like rrr, rrr, rrr. you know you find the 180 degree null and I did that yesterday and then I'll start the song there uh in the intro and then once I'm in the body of the tune I don't work anymore there's enough noise going on especially like in that tune there's a do -dark 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 thing going on the whole time and the you know, you know, there's enough noise going on where you won't hear it. But, um, you know, it's it's like the art of finding those 180-degree nulls as well as using the volume control on the guitar as much as you can. Uh, are you playing Eruption in standard tuning? Just wondering. Saw a clip where the band appears to j go straight into Jump, Michael. Uh, yeah, standard tuning with um, nine and a half. So it's actually kind of hard because it's like a big part of Eruption and getting it up to speed and actually doing it full force like the right tempo is E flat with nine to 40 strings. Um, it makes a big difference in how easy it is to play. So I'm on nine and a half and so doing it in E and it, it's a little bit of a struggle. It's good for my hands too, to do. And yes, it's in E and um, cause then we go right into the key of C and play jump. So um, I could take the guitar off, I guess, and change guitars. I have time during the intro to do it, but uh, I could play a different guitar and jump, I guess. but and play it in E-flat, but that would require having a whole other guitar in E-flat, and I just said, no, nah, screw it, let's just do it in E. Um, it's a hell of a lot of fun to play, though. It's kind of scary every night to do it, to be honest, but it's like, it's really fun to dive into it and just it's, hit the gas, go for it. And some nights I'm better at it than others, you know. Some nights I'm like, oh, I'm just not quite as good as I would have liked to have done it. And other nights I'm like, wow, I was smoking on that part, maybe i got to work on that part a little more, but you know how it is. But it's really great practice to play that thing in front of, like, a thousand to two thousand people every night or whatever and really try and you know just go let's go don't suck do it i don't know it's fun um it's a challenge you know i was kind of scared to be honest to do it the first time in front of people i'd never played it in front of people i'd only done it in the confines of my own studio where i could like sit there and play it sitting down and get a good take so to just bust it out on a gig was and now i do it every night it's almost it really fun actually and it's just good to tackle things like that i think somebody uh, uh from wales up there pete i don't have a lot of experience with marshall I'm looking to get one for a classic marshall sound what's your th thoughts on which one to look at up there in the top chat thank you so much um uh only got a few of you guys up there i gotta get to all this um well um if it's a marshall for sure that you're sort of dead set on and you want to get something classic i would say look at those new studio vintage 20 ones uh, there's a head and a combo version, I think, and I would look at that. People seem to really like them. You know, they're not like, maybe the best manufactured amps in the world and all that, but people seem really happy with them online, and like they, people say generally they get a to like, it seems like a nice way to get into that plexi ballpark, um, you know, for probably a pretty reasonable price, and, and they do that thing and probably a little, you know, a little more reasonable volume than... <laughs> many of the amps out there, so I would probably look at those. Um, that, that would be where I would look. Um, 
Now, if you want a really great amp, you know, look for the SL67 or SL68, you can probably find one used at this point, you know, for a pretty reasonable price. And it's hand-wired and really beautifully made, and it's got a uh, post-phase inverter master on it and the two-position voltage switch and all that good stuff. Um, David F. is in the top chat. Thanks, man. He says, have your guitar nerd CD on in the car. It's a great listen on the road. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Have a beer or latte on me. I have one. I have a cider and a latte. Basically every day, so you're helping me out. I appreciate that. Thank you, man, for the top chat. Michael's up there, too. You sound awesome with the classic rock band and the PT-15. Sounds amazing. Are you guys playing to a click? Occasionally. Um, you seem to be totally in sync uh, with the jump video behind you. Yeah, so that's right. Anything where there's videos behind, obviously, we'd have to be on, on a click. I'm generally not listening to it, actually. Um, I'm almost off the in-ears completely, actually, uh, and just use, because I have the luxury right now of having a wedge and in-ears, two wedges, actually, and, and an ear mix. And, I, and I'm on the ears and killing my ears, because it's pretty loud up there, but, um, but uh, I'm having a great time doing it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, yeah, that's how they stay in sync with the click. And, and, and you know, when they made the the, uh, the, the to sync the video so the band's playing just so anybody out there hasn't seen the show you know the band's playing and then generally speaking at least half the show there's like a video of the actual band that we're recreating the song from playing behind us like for the Who and uh, Queen and um, and uh, so obviously you would have to and, and many of those songs weren't cut to a click in the studio so they had to be tempo mapped and you know when they went through and actually did it with the video, they'd have to go through and actually, you know, like, so um, Carl, the drummer, has a real job of sometimes, uh, you know, trying to, to, to play along to that. He's got to really, he's, you got to be, you know, make it flow and make it natural and stuff like that. Um, it's, a, it's a skill for sure. Uh, so that's pretty cool. But, um, but I generally aren't, I'm not listening to the click really most of the time. I can't get into in here, says uh, McWalt. Um, just don't feel connected to my sounds or the rest of the band. Me either, man. I'll wear them sometimes, um, like on some things where it's like, okay, I really want to hear a click on this, just so I can, you know, say certain venues are like really roomy and you can't, it's like, okay. Like the middle of uh, the song, we played Bad Out of Hell, and in the, there's a middle part where the drums are super low dynamic, and I kind of can't hear them on stage with all the other stuff and the echo of the hall, and I'm playing this arpeggiated part on the guitar and it's like there's no way I'd, it's i find it really hard to stay in time and i'm not confident on it if i can't hear the time so i'll put the inners in for things like that lately um and they are helpful for that um boy a bunch of you guys up there in the top chat the classic rush show is great what's the most challenging thing for you as a musician on the tour well it's that back half of the set because we do um Thanks, man, for doing the top chat as well. Stealth Parrot up there. I appreciate that. Uh, we do, like, the second half is War Pigs, which really isn't that hard, but I have a hard time remembering the order of the solo because we sort of play a dual solo on that, and I don't know why. Sometimes it's based on it. But we do that, and then we play Hotel California, and go, and that's always, uh, you know, it's not like a super technically complex thing to play, but it's, like, it's very precise playing. So, uh, but I don't... It's like I find it difficult, but you have to concentrate, that's all. Um, and then there's Bohemian Rhapsody, which is fairly... It's not really that hard, actually. Um, coming out of that, the battle to hell is actually pretty challenging. you got to keep it, because it's like constantly changing tempo, and constantly you're like, where are we? And it's a weird... It's all like key of F and B flat, and it's, uh, it's, it's a weird... Um, it's a very strange guitar song. Um, T-wise, you know, obviously it was probably written on piano or something. Um, <coughs> so that's weird. Uh, you got to kind of stay focused for that because it's like a 10 minute. And then coming out of that is the whole like eruption jump. And then I played Thunderstruck right after that, which is like, it's not hard either actually at this point. It's super fun, but it is like, it's just, I'm constantly playing notes for about the, the you know, the jump's not hard except for the solo. It's kind of, you know. Uh, it, none of it's hard at this point, to be honest, to, be, to tell you the truth. It was in the beginning, and then now it's like uh, we've done 20 shows, I think. So now that I've done it live 20 times, it's like it's all there, you know. Um, uh, and it's just super fun. Um, the uh, the uh, last, I mean, the encore is so much fun, like, because we do little Beatles. And, well, I'm going to spoil it for everybody out there if you haven't seen that. I guess everybody knows, but there's... there's 
I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> In case. Uh, War, War Pigs is an album as well. That's uh, true. Uh, what's your favorite original to play? Of my songs? Um, well, that's a good question because I've never done a tour yet, officially, of my own music. Um, you know, there's only a limited amount of times that I've actually played my own stuff live, so I need to change that. But um, So I don't have a good answer for that yet because i gotta, I got to work up a whole set and see. I mean, in the past, it's like... I, I, yeah, I haven't done it enough to know because I'm just, you know, I've, it's like I'm, I'm at that point like where we're playing my own songs. It's like, um, I'm perplexed is pretty fun to play, but that's the one I've probably done live the most. So, you know, I'd have to, I have to play more and, and do 10 or 15 gigs and then I could tell you, you know. Okay, best uh, solution to justify buying a 50 to 100 watt amps to like the two notes captor X. Um, two notes uh, makes good solid loads. I mean, my, my, I like their products and I like the company. My favorite one is the reactive load. Um, I think that it, uh, you know, is definitely very safe for a hundred watt amp. Um, you know, it's not going to blow up if you dive a hundred watt amp into it. Although you're you are going to tax your amp, obviously. Um, somebody else up there in the top chat. Wow, we got a lot of people today. We got three hundred seventy nine people online. It's awesome. I guess it's just part of doing it at the regular time, right, guys? Sorry, I don't always do that. Rick USA is up there, and he says, I own um, 11, what's it say? 11 500 series mic pre's in my lunchbox, all the versions you'd expect. Cool, I have uh, space for five more. Would you add more pre's, or would you add EQ compressors, verb 500s, and you own most of the UAD plugins. Well, you got a lot of stuff already. I would probably get something you don't have. I mean, do you have distressors? Or don't they make those in like uh, in the 500 series? I would probably, if you don't have any outboard compression or EQ, I would probably go that route. I mean, if you've got 11 mic pre's, you got a lot of stuff. Do you have the Maris? Because the Maris is the one that's really, to me, unique, the 440, uh, in that it um, has an effect level, effect pedal level effects loop on it. So if you're doing, uh, you know, a vocal and you want to put a fuzz pedal on it, you can do that, which is a really unique thing. Um, if you're recording acoustic guitar and you want to put a, you know, electro harmonics, electric mistress flanger on the sound and record it, you can do that, you know, right at the source. Um, so check out the Maris if you don't have it already um, in your... Uh, what's a distressor? I hear about it a lot, says Levi. It's a compressor from um, Empirical Labs. It's a really, really great, versatile studio tool, um, just a killer compressor that can emulate a lot of different other compressors. I think they make it for 500 series, don't they? I don't know. Somebody else up there might be able to... Um, I mean, in my 500 series rack, I have a Maris 440, and I also have their Mercury 7 Reverb, which is incredible, but I just have the mono one. I actually want to get another one because I want stereo. It's unbelievable. It's the Reverb that was inspired by Blade Runner. So for ambient stuff, it's just gorgeous. It's like these huge reverb tails and stuff it'll do smaller reverb sounds too but it's really great at that like soundscapey stuff um so you can get those and you can get them in stereo and link them for the 500 series it's pretty amazing sounding i mean honestly for a guitar uh if you do any kind of ambient stuff glenn saying joe meek compressor God, i haven't heard of those for a while i remember those when they came out in the 90s they were all the rage for like a cheaper kind of vibey compressor uh, this is a great time for the UK. It's 1930 at the moment. Exactly. That's where I am. Uh, let's see. Gary says, do you know which is the closest fuzz on the Helix to a Sir Rufus? I don't. Um, a Rufus, so depending on the version of the, it's a tough question. Depending on the version of the Rufus you have, there's octafuzz sounds. There's one that's a little more muffy. Um, so the Rufus changes sounds, actually, depending on whether it's the Rufus or the Rufus Reloaded. The reloaded version, I believe, is the one that has the octave, I think, octave fuzz. Um, so, um, you know, whether, you know, when you've got a Rufus, you can hold down the switch and it'll change the sound. Like some of the sur pedals, like the Cocoa Boost, if you hold the switch, it changes it from clean to clean boost to mid boost and all that. Same thing with the Rufus. So I would say one, I would say the Octavio would cop the octave thing and um, probably whatever the Muffy style one would cop cop like probably the basic rufus but it's been a minute since i played for through rufus to tell you the, the truth uh 
hit the thumbs up button. People says, Steven, thanks, man. Yeah, if you don't mind, that'd be awesome. Give me the thumbs up. Uh, distressed is an outboard compressor, said Sam. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let's see. All this technical jabber. Please speak English. <laughs> that's what we do here, Mr. K. We do the tech. That's what we're here for. The technical jibber jabber. That's what we're here for. That's what I'm here for. I don't know very much about most things, but I know a lot about one very specific thing. And that's what these folks come here for, as well as maybe the coffee and hopefully a couple of laughs. And I don't know. To hear a, a sick guy talk about guitar stuff. Uh, cheers from Portugal, says Felipe. What's up, man? How are you? Good to have you here. Been a minute since I've been in Portugal. Pete wrote some tunes. Uh, what's that say? Uh, Pete Paul Ewing says, uh, Pete, write some tunes for a three-piece. Live is a lot simpler. I finally have, and I wouldn't go back. That's a, that's a great advice, actually, Paul. Um, maybe I'll try and do my next album a little more stripped, like a little bit more like the q Blues vibe from my last record, a little less layered. You know, maybe I should do a little bit more um, trio feel. I mean, there's, uh, you know, uh, Dirty Town. I could, you know, but I definitely, like, when I look at the songs I'm going to be able to play, if I had to play as a trio, it would be tough. You know, I'd kind of need another guitar player. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, that's really good advice, I think, actually, and I might, I might think about that, like, for next time. 387 people online. Let's get to 400 today. Come on, folks. Tell your friends to sign on. Uh, hey, Pete, Mike Skinner here. Thank you for a great show. Norwich. Norwich. I know it's not Norwich, is it? I learned that the hard way. Norwich on Wednesday. Uh, hope you got some video and pictures while you were here. I did. Um, I've been taking video and pictures everywhere. I'll, I'll put it all, whatever comes out interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'll put in my vlogs. For sure. Took a bunch in Liverpool yesterday, too. Uh, what box are you housing your 500 series in? I have a uh, uh, Vintage King chassis with six slots in it. So that's it. Right now, it's just got a DBX Pre, a DBX 160 compressor, the Maris, and the, uh, Mar the Maris 440 mic pre, excuse me, and the Maris Reverb. That's it. And then two slots are in so I don't do a lot of like, like tons. I mean, I have quite a bit of outboard mic pre. I guess I have the Maris and the DBX, and then I've got a two-channel API, and I've got two channels of BA Neve 1073, and then I've got a 610 pre. So I do have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven outboard mic pre's. Um, but I'm not like doing drums all the time and stuff like that, and like barely ever. So it's mostly just I'm recording two or three things at a time tops. So... Um, I feel like I kind of got it covered, you know, like anything else is just, I don't know. And Cody says, Pete, you look like Michael Caine. How do you do your Michael Caine? Michael Caine, Michael Caine, and blame it on real. Uh, I don't know what I look like today. I look ridiculous. You ever, anybody ever seen that movie, The Trip? Michael Caine, Michael Caine. When they, when they talk like they're at dinner and they're doing their Michael Caine impressions, it's amazing. I love that movie. If you've never seen The Trip and then The Trip to Italy, oh my God. Steve Coogan. Those movies are so funny. That whole scene, the Michael Caine scene, as well as when they uh, when they talk about uh, uh, if if when people got up in the morning, we shall ride into battle at dawn. At no, we shall ride into battle at noonish, noonish. But after we eat breakfast, like did they do that? Did they all get together and have breakfast before they all, you know? I don't know. Anyway, it's funny. It's they, They're much funnier than I'm making it sound. Uh, Chris says, using your Eruption YouTube series to relearn it, can you talk about it or share any thoughts on Eruption? Sure. Um, up in the top chat there. Thanks, bud. Appreciate that. Uh, and somebody else. I, I will in just a sec. Evan Ward says, Nichols on me. Thanks, bud. He's up there in the top chat, too. You guys are too cool today. Thank you for doing this. Um, I really do appreciate it. Um... Okay, uh, eruption. Some thoughts on eruption. The hardest part is the bendy part at the beginning, or the high part. 
And then the next part, the tremolo picking part, is easy for me. Um, but the the bendy thing is that is hard to get the phrasing right. <coughs> but I explain it. I break it down pretty well in that video um, from so many years ago. And then the next hard part is the pull-offs in the middle with the trilling. And it's probably easier for some people than others, but trilling is really hard for me. I don't have, like, super fast trill ability. It's getting better, though, actually, on this tour. Um, but, like, my trilling's not, like, for whatever, trilling, you know, doing hammer pull, hammer pull. Um, I just don't have, like, I can, be, I can do three things in a row, like three fingers in a row quite fast, but, like, two fingers and back and forth, like, some people just have that, you know, ballistically fast trill ability, and I've never had that. I have to work really hard at it to get it up to something like the speed that eruption is. You know, because he does the trill in there. That part's always really a little bit tough for me. Um, other than that, it's just the phrasing, listening to it at a slow tempo, and then, like, getting it, and just, I don't know, it just clicks after a while. If you, it's, it's a fun one to try and nail, that's for sure. I wish I could see it uh, easier than that. Um, uh, what else we got here? 396 people online. Oh, we're so close to 400. I don't know why 400 is important, but uh, I'm just thinking it'd be cool. Uh, if we got there today. Hey, Pete, while well, listening, I tried to find a small compressor pedal because space on the board is running out. Any tips? I use the Ego, the Ego, uh, Mini Ego, and I'm very happy with it, actually. I think it sounds really good. 398 people. Come on now. 400. 400. Uh, Wampler Mini Ego Comp. Really nice. I like the little treble switch on it. It's nice to add a little bit of sparkle to the sound. Um, and I also like the SP from, I think that's what it's called, right? From uh, Exotic. That's a nice mini one. So both those are really good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, huh. Let's see. The tapping section is the easiest. You know what's funny about the tapping section, though? When you play it live, it's like the biggest, uh... It is the easiest, but try and do it in front of people, like a lot of people, <laughs> after just playing the other stuff and then getting into it. And like, it's sort of a zen thing. You have to zen out. It's like a golf swing. Does anybody out there play golf? I used to. And you know, when you try too hard and then you just end up duffing the ball or whatever, like it's kind of, that's what the tapping part interruption is. The more you just kind of close, if you close your eyes like he does actually when he plays it live, try it and just almost like Feel it and like, for, like, use the full house, Luke, like Luke with the blaster thing on, and you know, um, <laughs> you know, trust your feelings. Um, just, just like, uh, don't, don't think about it too much because it, it can, your hands can start to cramp if you start to think about it too much. And if you, if, the, if you get, if you get freaked out at all, you're in trouble, you know, when you're doing the tapping thing because it's so relentless, it never stops. So it's like, you know, if you fall, it's like falling off. You know, like uh, if you were t walking on a tight wire, and if you're just in the zone, you're cool. But if you freak out, then you're screwed. You're gonna fall off. It feels like that a little bit. Um, so it's funny because it is kind of the easiest part, but it's also can be the the part that'll screw you. So, of course, you know, Jason Becker used to play it like while he was doing yo-yo with one hand. So, does anybody know that? <laughs> If, if nobody's ever seen it, go YouTube. Not now. Don't leave. Stay here, but watch it later. Make a note. Uh, I used to used to like walk the dog and stuff like that while playing Eruption with the other hand. So, kids these days or kids back there. Uh, Frank from Norway is in the house. What's up, man? Uh, wish there was a version of the SP with foot switchable compression level. Foot switchable compression level. Like two different. But, Neat thing to have a compressor with two. Oh wait, that's like a slide rig from Cali seventy six or the the Origin. Don't they make they make a two button compressor, right? <coughs> two different settings. Of course, it's huge. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Four hundred eight people online. What's up, folks? Great to have you guys here. Um, SP compressor is awesome. Anthony says as well. I agree. It's a really good one. Very simple. Two knobs and a switch for compression amount. It's cool. Uh, oh, 
Oh, sorry. Uh, Jim says his what happened. My top chat on the unit sixty seven got skipped. Sorry, dude. That's Jim. What uh, what did you ask, Jim? And I'll get to it. I'm sorry if I missed it. Sometimes they go fast, and then you, you, you they go by, and you know because it's like I'm on my iPhone. It's like a little screen. You see them, the way that they show up for me. It's tough. Uh, ask again, and I will answer your question. I promise you have my undivided attention. I'm, I'm kind of looking back here through the uh, the chat to see if I can find your comment, but I can't. I don't know if it came through, dude. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing it in the last 20 minutes or so. Um, but ask again. Um, any thoughts on... Keeley Compressor Plus. Is that the big gray one? Pretty cool. Really adjustable. Um, it's like a lot of pedal. Like there's, you know, are you, you're talking about the big gray one with the VU meter on it or the dots. It's not VU meter. It's not a VU meter. It's like a gain reduction with a bunch of red dots, right? Pretty cool pedal, I thought. Um, I did a demo on it years ago, but that was the last time I've actually played through it, to be honest. Main reason it being because it's big. And I and I need the smaller pedals too, so that's why somebody was asking about small compressors. Wondering my thoughts, says Rob. Um, guitar has HSS configuration. What sir single coil would I recommend to complement complement the Thornbucker Plus? I tried the um, V63s in the red guitar I have now. They sound good to me. In the past, I've used V60 LP on most of my guitars, and I really like them. And I think both of them seem to balance pretty well. I don't know that I have a clear favorite right now, to be honest. I'd have to really listen. Because the, the other thing is that the guitar is uh, so different, the guitar I have now, because it's a maple neck, maple fingerboard, instead of a rosewood, so it's a little bit of a different thing. Uh, for trills, try index, middle, index, A. What does A mean? Is that the third finger? Uh, instead of index, middle, with the M and A hitting the same note. Classical guitar to the rescue. What does that mean? Index middle, index A. I don't understand, but thank you. Uh, yeah, up there in the top chat for helping me out with that, but I don't, sorry, index middle, index A. Are you saying to go, oh, you're saying, oh, oh, that's interesting. So you're saying on the same fret, when you do the trill to hit, like, so if it's like the first fret and the second fret to bounce between your first, your second and third finger on this hand, on the, I'll try that. I've never even thought of trying that before. So, need idea. Thanks for the idea. See, we're all learning from each other here. Uh, Pete, if you won the lottery tomorrow, how would your life change? Would you focus on your own music more? Or would you continue to do your awesome gear demo videos? I probably would, yeah, because I'd be bored otherwise. I mean, I love what I do, so I would probably just make more records and make occasional YouTube videos. The YouTube videos are fun. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, when people retire and they just get old and decrepit, you know. you got to do fun stuff when you're, even just because you have money or whatever. Or, you know. So if I theoretically had enough that I didn't have to work, I would probably still keep doing some of the same stuff, you know. I mean... It's like, I need a balance to be happy. Um, I was talking about this uh, with the fellow that's out mixing us. He likes to work in the studio, too. And I was asking him if he feels like he needs a balance of studio work and live work. And he said, yes, absolutely. And I was like, yeah, me too. I need, like, 50-50. Like, I don't like to do all YouTube or all my own music recording, making records, or all live touring with other artists. Or I like uh, to do it all. And then I feel like I'm, you know, you know what I mean? Get a little bit of a mix of things going. So I would, I would probably just keep, keep doing all that. Uh, is there a, another instrument you wish you'd learn to play other than guitar? Well, it's never too late, and I do want to learn keys someday. I want to get, like, I'd love to buy a piano and take piano lessons. You know, I have this like dream of taking piano lessons from like a nice old lady or something like that, and uh, uh, learning how to play the piano. <laughs> so. But, no, not really. I wish I could play some drums. I stuck at drums. Um, but, but really, it'd be piano. That would be the number one thing. Do you get every Sunday off? No, that's Gary. I've had a couple off on this tour, but um, we've also gigged a couple. Finger picking is beyond me, says my knees hurt. Uh, it's not really that 
tough. You just got to kind of like apply it like anything. I mean, you could probably find some great beginner finger picking or Travis picking stuff online where you could learn, you know, some good basic patterns and stuff. And then once you get it, it comes slowly. But uh, how did you like playing with Draco back in Puerto Rico? Great memories. That's a noisemaker. I used to play with Draco Rosa. And, um, I really enjoyed my time in Puerto Rico uh, at the... Uh, the theater, we did that run of gigs down there. And also we did the big gig, the big, um, where we filmed the DVD right after Hurricane Jean, I think, that week. Um, the power came on that day and we were able to do the video. I remember filming the video that day and there was 20,000 people there. It was a really great gig, super awesome gig. Um, great. I, I, love, I love that guy. He was awesome. He was a cool guy. He was like... Um, he called me. I didn't talk to him in, I mean, six, probably 12, 13 years, something like that. And my phone rang while I was in Germany, actually, at the Toman, uh, you know, YouTube gear thing. And one morning, really early, and I picked it up. Pete, yeah. Hey, man, it's Draco. <laughs> you know, and I was like, what's up? And he was calling me on WhatsApp, which nobody does. Uh, you know, and um, anyways, he he got in touch with me and uh, and it was really cool. And he was like, "Oh man, you're well, call me when you're back in the states or whatever." And I still haven't called him. Like I gotta I gotta call him back. Like just but he was just phoning to say hi, I guess, just check in, see if I was still alive. I don't know. Um, and that was cool. He's a cool dude, you know. Um, he's a he's a crazy artist, but he's a lot of fun. That's for sure. Uh, my favorite thing that he ever said, I always remember, was, I just want to have a good time. <laughs> and I was just like, I think about that a lot, actually. Like, I just want to have a good time, too, really, like, on stage and making music. It's just a simple thing to say, but, like, I just want to have a good time. Like, you know, that's all he, you know, I don't know. And the other thing he always said that resonated with me was, ultimately, it's about the body of work. Like, for any artist, ultimately, it's about what you leave behind and what you've created or whatever, and that. I don't know. I remember a few of those key things that he... He's a profound dude, you know? He just kept your ears open. and He's got, like, a lot of similarities with somebody like Cornell and uh, also Chiyoshi, really, the fellow I play with in Japan, really reminds me of him in many ways. There's differences, but uh, but there's also a lot of similarities, like that certain personality, bigger, larger than life, very great with a lot of people in big crowds and able to... You know, masterful uh, performer from an early young age that know how to command a big audience, and they, that's like their office. They know how to do that vibe, and it's a special breed of folks, you know. Um, so, uh, yes, also index pinky index ring for bigger stretches. Interesting, man. That sounds cool. That's a uh, uh, once again, um, Gabrielle uh, up in the top chat I and mean, you don't have to do the top chat man you're giving me a guitar lesson <laughs> but thank you that sounds really cool um i kind of get the idea i mean it is i'll have to give that a try uh it sounds like a, a unique way to play a trill for sure have you ever played a buddha amp only a couple times think about picking up a buddha super drive says william uh going back and forth well if it floats your boat you know you gotta buy it sight unseen or something or you know if you play through it and it speaks to you um you're on in-ears and monitoring on the tour how come doesn't one make the other redundant no not really um your amps on stage you don't need wedges for feedback loving the tour vlogs thanks man yeah um so sometimes i want to hear a click because to stay in time or i need it for the intro of a song or two I use it on the very first song, for example, so the drummer doesn't have to do, give a count. Um, it's better for singing for all the... If I was singing more, which I'm not on this set, because the, the previous guitar player didn't sing that much, I guess, and so there just wasn't that many vocal parts, and that's good for me, because I had so much to tackle anyway, guitar-wise. I'm not the world's greatest singer anyway. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's it's like they, they said, you can have a wedge if you want, you know, and I was like, oh, cool. I wasn't planning on it. I thought it was going to be just ears. So definitely. And then I listened to the ears. For, I hate guitar through ears. You know, I, I just it just confirmed my on this tour. You know, it just sounds like 
that scratchy kind of shitty sound. You guys know what I'm talking about if you use in-ears. You can have a great tone. It's, it's also part, part, part to do with the wireless aspect of in-ears. Um, because I know a cable sounds better, like a hard line sounds better than the, than the, than the, the you know, wireless in-ears. Um, that's why drummers many times want a hard line. Keyboard players, they don't use the packs. They use a hard wired pack. It's a better sound. <coughs> it's a crap kind of quality to the guitar sound when it's coming through in-ears. And it's not nice to listen to, and it doesn't resemble real. So you're always fighting that. And it's always too... It's not, it's, sometimes it's not loud enough, sometimes it's too loud, and then you play timid, and you hear every little damn mistake you make, and that freaks you out, and so then you back off, and you play. And when I just take those damn things out, and I hear the crowd, and I forget about all that shit right away, and I just start having a good time. And then I mix myself by walking closer to the drums or walking further away from them, and every instrument, I do that, you know, closer or further away. It's rock and roll. It sounds great. I don't want to fight it anymore. I just don't care. I don't, like, it's like the, the in-ear thing. I just, if I have to use them, I will. And if I don't have to use them, I prefer not to because I have a way better time. And it's been 20 years that I've been using those things now. This is like the 20th year, I think, that uh, I've been fighting this battle with them. And, you know, when, when you don't like something for 20 years and you keep confirming over and over and over again, no, I still don't like it. Still not great. At that point, it's just like, why do I fight it anymore? I don't like them, you know? And that's it. You know, enough, enough, you know? <laughs> so that's the way I feel about it. So if I can have a wedge, I'll, I'll get one. And, and, and lately, most of the tours I've done, even, even Michelle Pulner, a couple of years ago in France, in 2016, when I toured with him, they said, you can have a wedge if you want, you know? And I, I was like, really? Okay, cool. And I, I ended up wearing in-ears on that gig. I was playing a lot more clean, I guess wasn't so rock, you know, that gig. So clean guitar can sound nice in in-ears, especially if it's in stereo. Um, something about distorted rock guitar and when you're rocking hard. If you're playing a little bit more ambient parts and stuff, it's like whatever. But um, on this rock gig, I don't really like guitar playing rock. I mean, I'm playing deep purple, you know? I don't want to play with in-ears. I just want to run to the front of the stage and, like, hear, you know, the PA. You can hear, you know, when the guy pushes you in the house, you know? And you're playing, you know, all the, so, sorry, highway star, you know, and you can hear it like really loud going up in the house. You're like, fuck yeah. Like it sounds like, uh, I don't know, it's like revving an engine on a car or something. And as soon as you got the inners in, it's just like your little insulated world with that scratchy, shitty little bright, sharp tone in your ear um, and all that, you know crowd and everything it's like i want to live all that stuff man it's, it's like you're not at the gig all of a sudden i don't know anyways uh yeah that's my diatribe on that uh, ugh, uh afternoon pizza zv man what's up what's up what's up go back to stack and let the audience use you in your says quinn <laughs> Um, am I on, oh, you guys are talking amongst yourselves about Spotify and Bandcamp, I see. Um, but when you're auditioning, yes, of course I do in-ear monitors. Yeah, no, absolutely. If people are like, hey, you got to use in-ears, is that cool? I'm always like, sure. If it's a gig I want, if, you know, if it's pay. It's when you get the option. You know, many of these bands will say, this band, they said, is an in-ear gig. I remember James saying that. Yeah, we're really going for low stage volume. And, uh, and it's an in-ear gig. And I was like, oh, okay. I was fine with that. And then I got here and they're like, do you want a wedge? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then I heard his amp and I'm like, it's not really that quiet. Can I play that loud too? <laughs> you know, he's using a 40 watt or 50 watt amp. And, and then I, I had mine and it's like, well, okay, this is like normal. I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, um, the same thing, like I said, with pulling the ref, you know, don't have to use the ears, you know. And it's fun. If you can get it, even if you just get side fills and you can pull the ears out some, sometimes, you know. Um, I've, mm, okay, the the pop gig I did a number of years ago with Milan Farmer, there was no wedges for that. That was all in-ears. 
There was some PA facing back at the band, like some monitors. But other than that, we were all on ears and there was no on stage sound. But that was a pop, very pop gig. And it's like, other than that, in the last 10 years, I have not done a gig where I, I don't think I've done a gig where um, I didn't have a wedge as well and where my amp wasn't on stage. So I've, I've always had on stage guitar sound and a wedge on stage other than one gig over the last 10 years. So, yeah. Pretty much. Melissa Etheridge, I didn't have a wedge, um, but there was side fills. Then one was right beside me because I was far stage right. And I said, can I just, because it was in your tour, but I said, can I get a little bit of drums and acoustic from her, like her acoustic and a little bit of her vocal in that? Because they didn't want to put vocal because um, it'd make the, you know, in the side fills because it'd make it feedback. I said, we'll put a little bit in. And I was like, okay. And then I could hear her and I could hear her in the house and I could hear the drums and I could hear the bass from the stage. And I was like, I don't need a wedge. Actually, I can hear that side fill perfectly, and I can just play um, with the ears. So I ended up putting no ears on that tour, too, most of the time. Used in ears for 15 years, says Leland. I'm done. Today, did I convince you? It's a good talk. I don't know. You know when you just know you don't like something? Like, why fight it? Like, oh, I'll try it again. I know Maybe I'll like it this time. No, you won't. You've tried it for, you know. It's like buying the same car over and over 45 times and then being like, I still don't like it. I don't know. Um, that's neat. You mix yourself bass where you are on the stage. It's Stealth Parrot. Yeah, I mean, it's the coolest thing about not having in-ears in. Okay, now, it's the greatest thing about in-ears is having a static mix if you're playing a big festival and you don't get a sound check. So if, if you're in a band and you guys carry mics, you know, and uh, you got your own monitor desk and stuff and you're doing it, like, okay, with pulling the ref, um, we we had our own monitor desk and stuff, but you didn't. We didn't never got a sound check from the festivals. We did some. We did some pretty big festivals that year in France. It was like sixty thousand people at one. I remember. And so when you're doing that, the consistency of the in ears can be great because at least you know you're gonna have your consistent in ear mix, and you can walk out front and go, okay, I can hear everything still. You know what I mean? Like when you set up on a big festival stage and you don't get any sound check, and you're like, I can't hear the drums, or the drums are slamming side fills or whatever, and it's like a house monitor guy or whatever. That can be problematic. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, sometimes for big shows. I mean, I remember touring with Lenny Kravitz in France with, with Cornell. We did three weeks, and Lenny actually, um, he's a great guy and everything. I had a lot of fun doing that tour, but for whatever reason, he didn't give us a sound check. True story, for the first, like, two and a half weeks. So... Uh, he would he would use up all this. They, they were working on pyro and lighting and stuff, and he would go right up to the doors, and then we would just have like basically have to line check. But we had our own monitor console, and we had our own mics, you know, all the drum mics and everything, guitar mics, and so it was consistent every week. The mix or every gig was consistent. Well, it was like, well, we don't really need a sound check actually because it sounds kind of the same from venue to venue every time. So then they can be a lifesaver in those situations. Um, Hey Pete, tips on releasing a signature distortion. I'm releasing my signature pedal today on my YouTube channel. Great pedal, but I know it's a tough market out there, says Jason. Well, there's a guy I know that just does pretty good video demos that can probably help you get some uh, exposure. <laughs> Send me an email. Uh, I'm going to premiere it after. Best of luck with it, dude. Um, I know it's a crowded market out there, but um, I would say good video, like really great video content, uh, and if it sounds great, it, they, they can tend to just sort of organically take off. I mean, it's a crowded thing, but I mean, it's like releasing a record, you know, it's like there's so much music out there, but if it's a really, really great song, it'll still connect. So Agreed to come by again. Sorry guys. I got to uh, just going to get online here and let somebody know that I'm doing my stream. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Actually, I, I can do I can do two things at once here. I know I can. Sorry. It's Brett trying to call me, and she generally tries to call me while I'm doing my live stream, <laughs> and then she'll call over and over and over and over again. Everybody can see me still. Okay, there's a question. There is Jim's question about the Unit 67. Do you use the Unit 67 like the freak out or? In line like the freak out or in the looper, is it an always on pedal? That's a great question. It's actually in front, and uh, and I I use it in front. I, I I like to use it as a boost. I think it's the 
So the freakout is the first thing in line, and then the unit 67 comes after it, and I'll use it to kick the rest of the rig. Um, so I'm just going to send a message here live stream. Um, yeah, um, so I'll use it. I'll use it first in line, and it does a great job. iPad here like I had it before, using it as a prop up for the iPhone. <laughs> All my Apple devices. Uh, and um, I love that. And I use it a lot in the show with the Classic Rock Show. I'm using it on, like, for any time I want more sustain. Like, I use it at the top of War Pigs because it's got a little bit of Range Master boost in it. So I have that on, and it makes the amp scream a little bit for the rhythm part you know, for the part of the beginning, the long-held feedbacky stuff. I'll kick it on for that. Um, what else do I use it on? I use it on the end of the show for the Beatles stuff to give it kind of like a treble boosty kind of kick to the front of the amp for the snarly kind of 60s tone. And then I use it on, I leave it on actually for um, when we play and won't get fooled again. If anybody's seen the show, I'm using the clean channel on the amp and then actually using the... Uh, I have kind of a weird thing going, I guess, because I've actually got, now that I think about it, the, the, the unit 67 on, and it's doing a little, little bit of compression, but just mainly a little bit of boost and a little bit of range master. And then I'm going into the ego comp, and then I'm going into the Bogner blue. So I'm stacking three different pedals there, and it's rocking sounding for like a rhythmy rock tone that you can almost, I mean, I play it for the Who stuff. Uh, for, for well, just for one good fool again, but with the Les Paul, God, it sounds good. With those three pedals going into the clean channel, um, it's a real f like I don't know. It just sounds great for playing that part. Um, you'll hear it sort of on when I, when I make my next vlog. Uh, I'll uh, I'll show you a little bit of a clip. The, the 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 phone is actually sitting on top of my guitar amp, so it's not getting very much direct sound from it, but you can still hear the tone, kind of like the off-axis tone or whatever of the amp in that clip, and it sounds really cool, I think. Um, I think my next pedal purchase says Stealth Parrot. I'm not sure if you're talking about that pedal or not, but uh, uh, do I ever want to join Wayne in losing my T-shirt at the end of the show? No, I'm not fit enough for that right now. I used to do that 10 years ago. <laughs> Even then, it was questionable. I'd have to be working out constantly. Wayne's in pretty good shape, man. That dude, he's 50. He just turned 50, and he, uh, but he'll go out and run like, you know, like I saw him come back the other day from a run. He just ran like five miles or something in the morning. He's hardcore. Uh, <coughs> let's see here. Um, what else we got here? What pickups do I have in my new S-style? Sir, it's a Thornbucker Plus in the bridge and two V63s. Uh, what do I think of the Philosopher's Tone pedal? Um, remember it being quite cool. It was like a really interesting. It's a long time ago. I mean, God, that's almost 10 years ago I made a video of that, or at least nine or eight. It's one of the ones I did in that house I had in Santa Monica. Uh, I remember Ian really liking that pedal as well from Big Rec. Um, Anyway, it's a compressor, isn't it, with distortion built in. And it was a really cool sounding pedal, actually. I quite, really quite liked it. Um, I remember Steve Vai telling me when I met him once that he liked that video. He's like, I saw the video you did for that Philosopher's Tone pedal. I liked what you played in that and stuff, and I liked the sound. That was cool. Um, just want to say I enjoy your, your videos, this is Robert. Thanks, man. I uh, really enjoy your playing. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. I do, I do, I do. Raymond says, a bit off topic, but you'd like to know how I sync my audio for video when editing the videos. Um, it does it in, um, in uh, Final Cut Pro automatically. Like if I pull in a, uh, you know, I don't know, like a few different video angles that have recorded camera audio, and then I've got maybe a song. Um, so, so if I'm tracking a guitar part, there's obviously a drum part that I'm tracking to, and maybe the bass or other rhythm guitars. So, so it's like the song's playing, which will cause audio spikes and things like that, right? And when you pull all that, all that information into um, Final Cut Pro, it looks at those because the file, you know, like things like 
drum pattern and stuff will cause the same spikes to happen in the same places on all the audio files, and then it'll sync them all <coughs> automatically. So there's a very easy way to sync or and or make multi-cam clips that are syncing like multiple camera angles along with multiple audio clips if you want. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see here. What else we got here, guys? Been at it for about 58 minutes. I'll go maybe, I don't know, an hour and 15 today, something like that. Um, am I still playing the TWE-1? Not right now. Um, I switched it out for the Bogner. Um, it's a cool pedal, too, like cool ampy pedal, for sure. Um, but I'm just kind of, I don't know, really happy with the Bogner at the moment. Um, I love it, actually, the Bogner Blue. I think it's a really great pedal for uh, the, the sort of plexi, pl 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 plexi thing. Uh, do ladies still throw their dirty underwear on stage? Has my knees hurt? I don't know. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen that happen. Uh, so, I would say no. I'm going to go with no. Not at my gigs. Uh, Behringer Dimension C. Somebody's recommending. Do they make a Dimension C? I don't know. William says, uh, oh, no. Okay, you guys are talking amongst yourselves here. I'm going to look for another question if i had three thousand pounds saved for an acoustic guitar what would i buy definitely vintage three thousand pounds <coughs> i would find a great old late 50s gibson j45 or j50 they sound like nothing else the simplest coolest acoustic guitar they have this bloom to the low end and this beautiful tone that's just like hard to argue with uh the sound of the low end. I always love hitting the when I see one hanging on a wall in the music store. I like to go up and just hit the low E string, and they go boah. They just have this amazing thing. And if you look at the bracing on those guitars, the way they were braced, it's so scalloped and thin, you know. And then you look at the bracing on a new. So so in other words, you know, the bracing is those wood pieces that go on the inside of an acoustic guitar, those strips. And if you look at a new guitar, they're like this thick, you know, and they're kind of round on the top. And if you look at an old J50, they're like scallop to a point, and they're very thin. <laughs> probably not as strong, which is probably why they do the big round ones, but I'm convinced that's why the tone is, is it's in the bracing, I think. Um, look, look, look under any old one, and you'll see what I mean right away. Um, the way they did the bracing is very different. And it's cool. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that... Uh, that uh, that would be what I would go for, or possibly a Martin, you know, D18, D28 from maybe the late 60s, because you probably have enough money for something like that. 3,000 pounds a lot of dough. I mean, that's like $4,500, I think, right? Almost. Something like that, maybe $4,000. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh... Are you in the Ant movie, says J.G. Hill Drums. I am, yes. Yeah, they came by and did a video with me. This is a long time ago, like a year or two ago now. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm actually in it quite a bit, and Sir's in it as well. Um, and uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, the talk about amps and what's cool about amps. Um, um, God, I'm forgetting his name now, and he's a he's a cool dude. I've met him actually a couple times. But the fellow that plays with Alice Cooper, he's great in it. He's really funny when he's pointing at his Kemper and at his Marshall, <laughs> and he's like, "Look at it! Look at that thing! Look how freaking cool it looks!" Like at his cabinets and his Marshall, you know. And then he's like, "Like what looks cooler, that or that?" He's like, "Give me a break!" Like you know, it's really funny because he's so you know, I get it. Like he's really passionate about it, and you know, he just likes amps. Um. So, anyways, where do you get your inspiration from? I mean, sometimes hearing other music, but mainly it's just sitting down with a, a sound inspires me. I don't know about you guys, but like sitting down with a, a guitar and an amp and a cool tone and, you know, a, a neat sound and then playing a note and then two notes and then three notes and seeing where they lead. Like that's kind of, you know just kind of comes out of thin air or something. That's what inspires me, like the sound and then hearing the music start to, oh, well, it would be cool if I went there after doing that. 
And then what if it went here and then opened up and did this? And it just kind of like, it's like a story or something, or like making a painting or something. So I would say sound and and a good a good tone and sound and then the right guitar in your hands, like, and then nothing in between A and B, like just being able to easily hit, you know, record. Uh, that's what I like. Jim says the rock show stuff on YouTube sounds awesome. It's a really good band, man. I mean, that's the truth. Uh, I mean, the players are good and the singers are super good and, uh, you know, and, and it's a nice group of people and everybody's just having fun playing music. So that's the, uh, the, the, you know, the fun thing about it. Just, it's, don't overthink it too much. Just get up and have a great time playing some great classic music that we all grew up on. Uh, let's see. Well, I'm going to go down to the bottom of the chat and see what else you guys are talking about here. Um, why do you always demoing something? Okay, what's your question? Skovic on guitar. Why do you always demoing something like a pedal with your amp PT100 or something? <laughs> well, because it's my signature amp, so what else would I do? <laughs> it's got my name on it. I don't know. If you had one of your name on it, you'd probably use it too. Oh, that sounded like a jerky thing to say. But, you know, I'm just kidding. I get what you're saying. You're, you, I think your, your point is probably like, uh, why don't you use like other... And I have recently, by the way, if it watched the video that I did recently on four distortion pedals that you need to hear, I used a Princeton reverb in it. So recently I got a little Princeton... And it's for it's for that purpose because like people are like, why do you always use you know, oh sure you're using these expensive amps or whatever. So I have the little Princeton you know, and uh, people liked it I think in that video because I switched between the PT15 and the Princeton and the Princeton's got a mic in front of it. There's one microphone in the room and it's a little combo with a 10 inch speaker that I'm just running clean. So I am starting to do that a little bit more to be honest to answer your question not to not be a jerk about it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm th I'm I'm. You know, doing that and also using a few, like, you know, occasionally I'll use Marshalls and I've got my my old 71 or 72, whatever it is, 50 watt, and <coughs> I'll use it or use the basement sometimes. The basement never sounds quite as good, though, as, like, it's, like, almost always, like, well, that sounds pretty good, but, like, it's a good 50 watt basement, but it's, like, the clean channel and the PT sounds almost the same, but a little better, and it's, like, what am I supposed to use the slightly worse sounding amp, like, just because it makes sense, you know? So I use the PT because it sounds like a slightly better version of the exact same thing, like a Fender tone, you know? To be honest, I don't know. Like, it's just weird to me to try and you know, to justify it. Uh, whatever you use, the tone is in your Pete Thorne hands. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. Tom's up there in the top chat. Thanks, bud. Uh, do I ever frequent the baked potato? I certainly do when Lando plays. I'll go down there when he's playing for sure. Uh, do I ever use active pickups? Uh, on my bass, I have active pickups. On acoustic guitar, I use them. <laughs> Never really on guitar, though. I love them on my bass. I think it's got the Warmoth, or Warmoth, uh, Warwick blah, 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 pickups on that one. Um, very good at a friend added Sir and your amps to his guitar shop in Arkansas. That's cool, man. Cool. He's a new dealer. Brad, tell him to get me out there for a clinic. I'll come out. What do you think digital pedal boards... Do I think digital pedal boards would take over in the future? No. I mean, they'll just continue to be like a, a thing. That, wow, we still got 400 people online. That's awesome. Good to have you guys here. 401, actually. Um, I don't think they'll take over, um, but they'll continue to evolve and be great and everything. But the pedal boards are so fun because of the modula modular nature of them that where you can switch out some pedal and put, right? And I think people like that, that fun aspect of pedal boards. And, and they sound great, you know? So that will never go away, I don't think. Like, some people are just going to want to use a few pedals and switch them out sometimes. And it's fun to be able to just spend 100 bucks on a pedal or whatever and switch it out for another one and not... You know, that, that modular aspect will always... Uh, uh, you know, be a part of uh, uh, guitar playing life, I think. I really dig Feisty Pete to Stephen Douglas. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'll keep it up then. 
Alan says, thinking of getting a Strium and Iridium for plug-and-play home recording, would you recommend the Iridium or anything else equally affordable? I like the Iridium. Um, I did a video on it recently. I especially like the Fender and Vox models on it. Uh, I think those are the best sounding ones. The Marshall one's cool. It's a little on the dark side to me, but cool. Um, you know, I got, I like the tones that I got out of it. Uh, I just found it to be like, sort of like on the dark side, uh, on the dark side. Uh, wasn't that, that song from that guy that sounded like Springsteen, the idiot on the dark side. Remember that dude? All right, I'll stop. Uh, uh, what else, would, what else we got here? What else would I recommend? Well, I think the competitor to the Iridium is probably, it would behoove you to probably also look at a Helix Stomp, HX Stomp. Uh, it's not that much more. Um, the other competitor would be the amplifier, the little guy, the little two-button foot switch amplifier, which is really good. You can, you know, the, uh, right? Amp, uh, what's that company called? Somebody help me out here. You know, the amplifier company. And they've got the little two-button one. It's two ninety nine, I think, and it's a modeling pedal. I did a video of my channel. Somebody put it. Somebody, somebody tell tell them what it is. You know what I'm talking about. That's a real good, real good option as well. That's is, yeah, simple effects built in. Can't remember if there was a delay for sure. It's been a minute. But anyway, I would say those two, the amplifier one. Then. I wouldn't say I had to be talked into it. I think rig videos are fun to make. Um, James brought it up, like, hey, would you want to do one of those? And I was like, yeah, sure, they're a good idea. I mean, they're good. Um, I was actually going to take my part and put it on my channel, but maybe it doesn't even make sense. Maybe we'll just leave it because like, it's on their channel. So uh, I was just going to take the, the uh, part from, you know, just, just my rig or whatever and just edit it down to that one part and put it on my channel. Maybe that doesn't make sense. Um, uh, question, how do you feel about the whole Dumble 2 Rock Fuchs Dumble clone tone? It's not really your usual bread and butter. What do you think? don't know that much about them. I've only, I've played a couple 2 Rock amps. I played, um, over at, uh, LA Vintage Gear in their old location. I played a 2 Rock and it sounded pretty cool. Um, uh, Fuchs played a couple of them a couple times. That's about it. I, um, you know, I'm a Sir guy, so I've used the Hedgehog a lot. And, you know, that's his Dumbledore. He never built it that way, which I always felt was like was a bit of a mistake on his part. But he didn't want to be like, hey, I'm, you know, it's it's not a Dumble. It's like his own take on that tone. And he never copies people, but he's like, he wants to sort of, he knows what's going on with amps. And then he wants to do his own thing. But yet, I think probably because of the Dumble thing, people would have been like, had he been like the D style amp for Sir Lovers or whatever, you know, like a marketing perspective, it might have made, because uh, I think probably a lot of people looked maybe at the Hedgehog and were like, what is it exactly? And it's like, had he just kind of gone there, then people, it would have made it clearer to people. Um, but it is, it, you know, it's it's basically a hot rod American amp with a with a dumbbell style overdrive um, type thing in it, as, as I understand it, and then the switchable, you know, mid boost and all that stuff. But it sounds anyway. Long story short, if you watch my video on it, I think it sounds great. I mean, I did a demo video of the Hedgehog, and I think it's a really terrific sounding amp. If I was playing with Don Henley again, I always said that I would might use the Hedgehog. Uh, instead of my amp, which is a more Marshally drive side, right? Um, it might behoove me, I think, to have a clean amp with a Fendry or American drive sound for Don's thing, actually. Um, that smooth kind of, you know, it's a little smoother, less aggressive in the upper mids and stuff, and fat. Uh, you know, it could be a great thing on a song like Hotel California, I would think. Um, uh, so, nice sounding amp. No doubt. Uh, ST Design said he's looking for a telly, digs a telly sound on the Pretenders and Toad the Wet Sprocket songs. I love the Pretenders guitar tones. I love those sounds, you know, honestly. Back on the chain gang and stuff and middle of the road and uh, great, great guitar sounds, you know, on, the, on that stuff. I always wanted to play with her, man. I'd love to play in a band with Chrissy Hine. would love to. Uh, let's see here. George says, um, can you record a video demonstrating 
how you can derive 78 ish Van Halen tones using the PT 15 IR instead of the SL 68, like you did in the cool Papa Stash video. <coughs> you know what I would do? Honestly, I would put the gain on the amp on about, because this is what I do, uh, on about six or seven on channel three um, with the bright on, and I would run the bass on. Well, if you want to watch that video I did where I was comparing the SL to the PT and trying to match the tones, you can see where I set the EQ. But honestly, generally, I've got the bass on about like 4.5 and the mids and treble on about 5.5. And the presence on about five or five point five, you know, like bright switch on, uh, gain on about seven, and then hit it with an EP boost from Clinch because it's like the Echoplex booster, and it does a wonderful Van Halen esque thing to the front end of the amp. It's like putting an Echoplex in front, run a little bit of echo in front, a little bit of reverb in the loop, and run a phase ninety, and you're done, you know, and the EVH flanger. It does great Van Halen. Sounds really good to me. Uh, you can hear it on YouTube. On the YouTube from the gigs we've been doing. Uh, let's see. Oh, wattage fender amps give one a good idea of how a pedal works clean, says Paul Ewing. Uh, amps with a high wattage and headroom are the worst. You can get fooled. Um, cool. clean amps with high wattage and headroom are the worst. Well, it depends on what you're doing, right? I mean, John, John, uh, Mayer uses high headroom clean amps. That's what he likes with pedals for all the sounds. So it depends on your, what you're, you know, the same pedal that's going to work with, uh, like a high watt, for example, you know, with a big muff and, you know, that's the whole Gilmore thing, obviously. I think of high watts as like English fenders, sort of. I mean, I know they're not, but you know what I mean. They're like cleaner and a little less compression and all that than a Marshall. Um, and the Gilmore thing was always either twins. He would sometimes use twins, and and then or high watts, and and then get all the tones from the pedal. So those are loud amps. So there is no right or, <coughs> or wrong to any of this. It's just whatever sounds good with whatever pedal you choose. Obviously, if you're running into a Tweed Deluxe or a Princeton or a deluxe reverb or something, it's going to respond a little differently depending on the pedal you have and stuff. So it's it's all a formula, you know. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Your pedal board or Kemper and Helix? Brief answer. What is it? I'm not sure your question, dude. That's the Solvik on guitar again. Your pedal board slash Kemper slash Helix. Brief answer. I don't know. You mean which what I... Because my pedal board, I'd still need, like, I've used my pedal board with a Kemper or, or Helix, too, because you can, I could do that. I, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. Like, what do I prefer? My, but the thing I prefer the most, still, is my amp with my pedal board, which is kind of what I'm using, you know, on this tour. Could I make it any better? I would go stereo. I would have, you know, two of my amps out here. But um, it actually works out great having just one because we're two guitar band, and it's great to have the, you know, old school, like, one guy panned a little left, while the other guy panned a little right in the PA, and, you know, not doing any stereo crap and any of that, so it works really good. But, yeah, my, my ultimate thing is just my PT-15 amp with, with my pedal board. Um, having said that, I mean, I did a whole run of clinics in Europe and Asia with the PT-15 and the Helix HX FX, which worked great, too. So that's a combined two of them, for example. Uh, ben Harper's Dumble sounded damn fine in his rig rundown, says Jerry. Um, cool. I haven't seen that. I should watch. I like Ben. Uh, I need to get you out to West Coast Guitars in Vancouver. I'd love to. There's been no talk of doing any Vancouver clinic ever. And I'm always like, isn't there a dealer in Can in the West Coast? Because I've done them in, you know, Cosmo and in Edmonton and in Calgary. And, um, I would love to go to Vancouver. It's been a long time since I've been there and I would make a vacation out of it, actually, because it's like... I love that town, and I haven't been there for uh, since something silly like 2012. It sucks because it's one of my favorite cities, so I want to go back. Uh, are you using HX Stomp in your current live rig? Just as my backup. So I have it set up with two sounds, like kind of like a crunch rock sound and then a solo tone. Uh, that I, I made two presets in case it's like, you know, the amp blows up or something happens. I don't know. Then something bad happens. I can plug right into the HX and it's going right into the PA and into my wedges. 
and I'll, I'll be able to, the show will go on. John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band, that's right. On the dark side. The guy sounded like, you know, he's trying to sing like Springsteen. Uh, greetings from Edmonton, says Dr. Psychedelic. What's up, dude? Uh, any advice on being more creative in music? Um, shorten your path from A to B, like whatever it takes to sit down and write. Um, you gotta make yourself a little writing studio that is easy to turn on and power up and be making music within a short period of time and make it easy to get inspiring sounds. Like for me, that's become like, I guess, sort of playing something like the PT-15 through studio monitors, like being able to you know, plug in, get some cool sounding guitar tones right away, like within five minutes, arm a track and hit record and go, you know. So, I mean, it's kind of a a long answer if I got into how I've done all that. But if you look at my studio rundown, you'll see how I've configured my desk so that I can easily get a pedal hooked up on my desk really quickly. If I'm doing like a YouTube demo or something, how I can patch in a you know, I can easily switch between amps by using an amp switcher really quickly. So all those things are designed to make the the, the flow quick and get some ideas going quick. Um, making templates in a DAW is a big one. So like when you open up a new thing in Logic or in new session in Pro Tools, whatever you've got, it opens up and you've got a blank kind of slate there with like tracks all ready to go and named like guitar, bass, drums, whatever. And you've maybe got a drum instrument plug-in already that pulls up. Uh, so that you can get a drum sound going right away and turn on the click right away and, you know, all that good stuff. This looks different for everybody. It could be like, you know, for a person that uses a Helix or a Kemper or something, it could be plug your guitar into there and have a whole, you know, like 25 sounds that are really inspiring to you. Stereo out, running into your interface, into Pro Tools or whatever, and you got tracks armed right away and you can go, I'm going to go to my ambient sound. It's sound number five and then... Within 10 seconds of turning on all your stuff, you've got this lush ambient thing that sounds amazing, you know. You know what I mean? Like, just whatever you can think of that works for your situation to make it easy. That's the most important thing. The problem is when you're like, yeah, I'm excited. I want to uh, sit down and make some music. And then you sit down and it's hard, you know. Like, oh, I'm still putting things in 10 minutes later. And you're just like, oh, I just want to watch TV now, you know. So, uh, Okay, uh, Atomic, that's it, the Atomic Amplifier Box. That was the little modeling unit that I was saying that would be a, <coughs> a competitor. Ben Coombs is welcoming uh, all joining in late. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for being here as well. Eddie and the Cruisers. That was the movie that John Gafferty and the Beaver Brown Band was in. She's real old, eh? Folks that remember that. Tell you what. Uh, blue guitar amp, somebody's saying. Blue guitar amp would be probably like more than, you know, he was saying like something in the, in the price range of the Iridium. Uh, so I was trying to think of things that were like under $500 or close. Uh, Pete, just want to say as a young player before you sign off, awesome channel, awesome work, always useful. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Cheers from Ohio, the birthplace of rock and roll. That's from Ian. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Uh, Evan said he had EMG act. He was in his gigging guitar in the early 90s. Very quiet and consistent. Even in crappy rooms. Wouldn't use them now. I like single coils, noise and all. Yeah, I don't mind noise. Like I say, you just turn around, find the quiet spot, and then once the drummer kicks in, nobody cares anyway. You know, I don't let noise bother me that much, unless it's really insane. But... Um, it's part of it, you know. Can I talk about how soloing style changed when I worked for Chris Cornell to adapt to more of a Seattle grunge type soloing style as opposed to traditional rock star solo, says Chris. Um, well, I soloed on, to be honest, so I took some of the Soundgarden solos on songs like um, Slaves and Bulldozers and a, sort of the middle part of Outshined and... Uh, uh, I think about Soundgarden, like Suicide, I played the solo on that, I played the solo on, which was hard because it's an alternate tuning, so there was only three strings I could really work with because those were the ones that were typical, you know, the pattern, um, uh, and maybe f like a few other Soundgarden tunes, maybe Love, Love, did I play a solo on that? I don't remember. Um, I don't know if there's a solo on that, I can't remember right now, but anyways, but I took a lot of the Morello ones. Uh, 
and Yogi took a fair, like he did Spoon Man and, and, uh, um, Black Hole Sun and, you know, a few of the big ones. And I always felt like that was a nice way to do it because I was a little bit more, especially back then, a little more clinical of a soloist, I guess. And, you know, how Morello solos or whatever. You know, I wouldn't always play his solos. I, I would sometimes play a few of the licks and then take off and do my own thing. Like a stone, I played verbatim because it's more melody than it is a solo. I feel like it's part of the song. Um, so I always played it totally verbatim with the right sound and everything. The whammy from day one, I did that. Um, but that split of the, you know, because Yogi is kind of like a more like a Hennessy style player, which ironically, I guess I've come more full circle. Now I'm totally into playing like that. I love that. Like I get to play Hendrix in this show, actually. And it's so much fun. Just go off and improvise every night. But back then, I was a little bit more like the note for note guy or whatever, you know? So so I would take a lot of those, so like in Be Yourself, I, I played a solo where I basically played a really similar thing every night. Um uh and and stuff and then Yogi would do the kind of freak out Hendrixy fuzz stuff. So um it, like you say the Seattle kind of Kim Kim style of playing a little bit more, you know, I guess. Um but I did play some of them like that, now that I think about it. I did play Slaves and Bulldozers, which was a blast to solo on and a few others. Um Yeah. Uh, let's see, what else we got here? What are you guys talking about? You guys talking amongst, amongst yourselves about gluten and drummers and all kinds of stuff. Um, is the rotary effect in the helix good for black hole sun? Um, I'm sure I could dial in in. Uh, did we do that? At the, uh, I'm trying to remember because I did this show where we played some of Chris's music and I used a helix. And I can't remember if we played Black Hole Sun or not, uh, if I made a preset. Anyways, I'm sure it is pretty good. Um, the best rotary sound that I've found in recent times is actually on the H9. It's great rotary in it. I know Peter Frampton really likes it too. Um, it's a really, really good rotary sound. Um, I used to use the Line 6 Roto Machine for, for that when I first started playing with Chris, which is always a Line 6 product, and it sounded really, really good for Black Hole Sun, I thought. Um, but I, and then for a while I used the Axe Effects for the rotary sound. Um, like just as an effect, I was using the Axe Effects for a while, you know, into an amp. Um, do French fries have gluten, says SD Design? Uh, sometimes, um, it depends, like, if other things, so many times, like in restaurants, things that go in the fat fryer, or, you know, is like, there'll be like, gluten, like, you know, they'll fry fish in there, or chicken, or whatever, with breading on it and stuff, and then they'll use the same fry oil for the 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 potatoes and uh so then there's a cross contamination and all that stuff so but sometimes gluten places fries will be free because they won't use the same fryer or maybe they use you know what i'm saying like they'll use a different one or whatever so you can always ask and see uh, um, yeah. french fries are really bad for you anyway um but I, I like them anyway. I probably eat them too much. But, you know, they got all that acrylamide. You guys know what that is, right? When you fry a potato, it makes this really carcinogenic substance called acrylamide. And <coughs> really, really high acrylamide in potato chips and french fries. That's why those pop chips are better for you and stuff like that. So they, and, and acrylamide causes cancer. So good, good one to know. Uh, but they're so good. So I still eat them and I shouldn't. But... Uh, gonna go grab a burger, says Glenn. He's up there in the top chat. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Love you, Pete. Keep gigging. Love you, too. Careful out there. Have fun. Get some fries with that burger. Don't listen to what I just said. Just enjoy yourself. Uh, Harley says the best import affordable rotary sound he's tried out lately is the Fender Pinwheel. Nice pedal. I agree. That's a good sounding rotary effect. I heard it at NAMM, not this year, but the last year. It wasn't at NAMM this year, and I thought it sounded great. Uh, give me more technical jibber jabber stuff, right? That's what we do here. One more reason never ever to eat a frickin' potato, says Alan. I know it's true. I've been on no carbs and no sugar for a month. It's miserable, says Alexander. Hang in there, man. Supersize that order. Baked is better in every way, <laughs> says Preston. 
my new local place now is gluten-free pizza with non-dairy cheese. Some of the non-dairy cheese is awesome, like the cashew cheese and stuff. It's like just good as regular cheese. It's not better, I think, in many ways. They kind of got the gluten-free thing and dairy-free thing. Like, it's all sussed now. Oat milk rules. There's really good, like, dairy-free cheese. You know, it's a good time if you're vegan or gluten-free or... Uh, yeah. God, I'm still have a sinus headache. It sucks. Got to get rid of this. Uh, have I ever played a guitar with a B-Bender? Only a little bit. Just messed around a little bit. Never really, like, got to record with one or anything. Uh, good preamp pedal for under $300. By preamp, do you mean, like, a boost or, like, something that, like, you can run as your overall amp sound? You know, I would say, like, if it's an overall amp sound thing, then you're looking at the Iridium or the, uh, once again, the Amplifier Box from Atomic. It was a really good one uh, for two ninety nine. It's under $300. Uh, Alan Bartlett says, Vibe pedal before or after. I always run the Vibe first. It doesn't sound right otherwise. Got to put it up front. It's responsive to the guitar, just like a fuzz, you know. Now, Vibe, fuzz... Then you're then you gotta figure that one out. Just try them both ways, see what you like. Um who did your last pedal board build? Dave Friedman. Done all my pedal board builds really, except for one or two over the years. Uh how did I spec my Thornbuckers? Um they're, you know, like low output. By low I mean like under nine K, not super low, but the neck is super low. It's about seven point three. It's like a T top strength, really. Um, but the bridge is uh Bridge is 8.4 or 8.7, depending on if you get uh, the Thornbucker or Thornbucker Plus. And depending on whether or not you get a 50 or 53, that spec actually changes. Because, of course, if it's a bigger pickup, then you need more wines. Uh, like if the pickup's actually spaced wider. <laughs> so that's kind of weird. But they sound the same. Uh, and it's, you know, the ice, it's a slightly mismatched wine, and the magnets are just what I like. So, how often do I get back to Edmonton? Not that often, once a year maybe, um, nowadays. Any tips on getting used to earplugs, says Leon. I don't really have any. Uh, I, I, I use earplugs once in a while. Um, I mean, I, I have, like... Frequency compensated, like nice ones. Although I don't know, I don't know where they are right now. I could have probably lost them. But um, you know, with like fifteen dB and nine dB filters, I can switch out. Those are okay. Um, for getting used to them, like if you're talking about when you're playing guitar and stuff, I would say the most important thing is put them in like way before you start rehearsal. Like so, you start to get used to the drop in sound before you turn on your amp and hear your amp. And then like, if you turn on your amp, play a little bit, and then put the earplugs in, it's like oh, this sucks. But if you put them in for 10 minutes before you start your rehearsal or whatever, turn on your amp, play a little bit, it sounds more normal that, like that, if that makes sense. So try that. Try, try, try putting them in and then kind of adjusting, kind of like you would if you like, you know, put on glasses and then walked into a room that was kind of dark, like sunglasses or something, your eyes would probably adjust a little bit. and it would be, You might forget you had the sunglasses on, but if you just put them on when you walked into the room, you'd be like, oh, I can't see anything. That kind of thing. Uh, if that analogy makes any sense at all. Should you, just a heads up, 90 minutes live, says Ben. Ben, you're right. I should probably split pretty soon. I'll go for another three, four minutes here, and then I'm out of here. Um, any point in having both the Volante and Ecos? I don't know. Both of those are Benson style, right? Probably not. Probably pick one. Marshall Preamp Pedal, any recommendations? For certain, probably the best one out there is the, uh, like, you know, most full-featured kind of Marshall in a box is the Revival Drive, I would say, either the compact or the big one. Um, Oat Milk Does Rule, says Ressington. I agree. That's good stuff. Cashew cheese sounds delicious. It is. It's really good. If you get most of that, like, nacho cheese dip stuff from either Whole Foods or from... Uh, Trader Joe's has a really good one that's sheep. Um, it's made out of cashew cheese, and it's freaking good, man. It's, like, really good. Try it. Tell me it's not awesome. It's like, you know, like chip dip. 
Uh, Tom says he can't eat gluten or dairy. I'm cool with dairy. I kind of eat dairy. doesn't really bother, especially over here. No problem. Like, I don't have any issues. No gassy, no bloated, none of that. In the States, a little bit. And all the milk's different, you know, there's a pasteurization and all that stuff. And everybody over here tells me the same thing. They're like, oh, yeah, when I go to the States, it just messes with my gut. But, like, over here I seem fine. Like, I'll get lattes, like, two a day kind of thing, just with normal milk. Because some of the milk over here, some of the oat milk over here has gluten in it. So I won't get that, even though I love it. <coughs> uh, but the dairy over here I'm fine with. It's weird. Uh, are you using HH Stomp as a backup, says Desmond? Yes. That's correct. Uh, I'm going to go all the way to the bottom of the chat and ask the last few things. And then I'm going to jet and just go chill the rest of the night. Uh, Nigel says, get a facial sauna in an early night. I don't know about that, but do you mean like steam myself? Yeah, I should. I think I will like turn on the sink and just put a towel over my head and see if I can't, you know, knock it out. Uh... That sounds pretty good, actually. Anybody else down here? Uh, with a question before I get out of here. Super easy to make your own cashew cheese. Says my knees hurt. I didn't know that. That's cool. This could become a cooking show. Cooking and guitars. Uh, I was specking out a Sur, and it basically looked like the Pete Thorne model. I ended up just getting the PT Sur. You know, the reality is it'll be cheaper. Um, because when you order a custom guitar, it's always more expensive. But the, the set model is actually like, it's like that f some people complain, why is your guitar so expensive? I'm like, it's not. It's actually thirty four ninety five, and for a custom Sur, like I would say, like try and find a Fender custom shop guitar that's that inexpensive. You can't find one. They start at thirty seven or thirty eight hundred dollars for the baseline, whatever's coming out of out of the custom shop. Um, so. Um, and the reason being because it's actually a line model guitar. In other words, it's like a set spec. Like it's my signature guitar set spec. But if you spec'd out a standard to the same, you know, maybe with like one thing different, it would be considerably more expensive. It's just, I don't know, economy of scale or something, I guess. Uh, right. Uh, when and where are you playing in Glasgow? Glasgow. Uh, I'm playing there like right away. I don't know the exact date and I can't really check it right now because I'm using my phone for the, um, and it's on my phone, but it's soon. Look for Classic Rock Show. If you go to their website, theclassicrockshow.com, I think it is, um, and do a little Google search, it should pop up right away. But we're, we're playing there like over the next, you know, seven or eight days, something like that. Uh, I'm doing three dates in Scotland, actually. So and I'm looking forward to getting up there, although it's probably going to be cold, but it's going to be fun. I like it up there a lot. All right. Uh, what reactive load box do you suggest for the 2-ohm Super Reverb? Not many options. Mm. I would, yeah, you don't, have, you don't have a lot of options there, unfortunately. I would probably get a, like a Fryat power station and just set it for four. It's not perfect, though. I don't know if there's a reactive load box that does two ohms. There's so few amps, I know, and that's a drag, but the super. Fryat power station. Yeah, but the Fryat doesn't go to two, does it? I don't think. I think it's just 4816. I mean, you can run a four ohm load and you'll be fine. You won't hurt the amp or anything like that. The one way mismatch up is not a problem. But the amp might sound a little different than, you know, might just respond slightly differently. Uh, <coughs> is the Super Reverb two ohms or forms? I think it's two. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. I'm going to split 97 minutes. That's enough. Ben Coombs has got his show coming up tonight, so be, be sure and go check that out. Thanks for being here, Ben. I appreciate it. And, hey, this was awesome today. It was just like totally normal uh, uh, turnout with around 350 to 400 people online. I'm so stoked. I can't believe everybody keeps coming back. I don't know. What are you guys, crazy? We have fun. I like it. Uh, I'll see you guys soon. I don't know where I'll be next Sunday, so I'll check, and hopefully I can do it at the normal time. If not, it'll be some tour bus insanity or whatever, like one of those other crazy ones that I've done. But you never know. Keeps it interesting, right? We are all guitar nerds, says uh, Alan. It's true. You guys are the best. Have a great week, and uh, wish me luck this week. I've got three in a row starting tomorrow and then another day off. And then four in a row. No.
Three in a row, day off. Three in a row, day off. Four in a row, home. That's what's going on. Okay, guys, take care. Rock on.